Good morning. A warm welcome to Newcomen Parish Church. We welcome those who will join us later online and on the phone. Well, we've all survived the cold, the snow and ice last week, so now we're just hoping we survive the wind and rain tonight that's forecast. But we come here this morning and to God's house to feel his warmth and love surrounding us. Our intimations this week are on your intimation sheet. On Tuesday, the Guild meets and all are welcome from 2pm, where somebody from the Development Trust will come and visit and give a talk. The Coffee Bean on Thursday also continues there. And the Burns Supper tickets are now in sale, so if you'd like a ticket, please do speak to Christine or any of the events committee. These are our intimations this morning. Thank you, Laura. Good morning, everyone. And it's good to see so many of you out on this cold, drich day. That's a good Scottish word, isn't it, to describe today. It's drich. But still we come here to worship God. So let us now do that. Let us worship God. Let us now all join in praise to God in the hymn, The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, one God, Father, Hun, Son, and Holy Spirit, the vast created universe declares your glory. The hosts of heaven worship your majesty. The whole earth exalts your holy name. Father, we come here this morning to find peace at the point where the rushing stream of life pauses and to learn more about your love for us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Loving God, we have read of your mighty acts among your people, and we rejoice in your power displayed in Jesus. We confess our faithlessness and lack of trust. We have lived sometimes as though your power belonged to the past. We haven't always trusted Jesus to work miracles of healing and forgiveness in us. We've looked at our own sin. We've been frightened by it. When we've looked at the sin of others, it has made us smug in the silence of our hearts and in the company of those around us, we remember now how and where and when we have sinned in thought and word and deed. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. May the Almighty and Merciful Father grant to each one of us pardon, absolution, and remission of all our sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and comfort of His Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord. Heavenly Father, speak to us this morning in this place. May we open our ears and our hearts to hear your word. And may your Holy Spirit give us strength in the days to come to practice it and to fulfill it. This our prayer we offer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Boys and girls, those of you who were here last week will remember I was talking about listening and how important it is to listen and I was talking about God can speak to us, and we have to listen for God. And he speaks to us through our Sunday school teachers, through our mums and dads and our grands and our grandpas. He speaks to us through people. And sometimes he speaks through boys and girls. Today, though, I want to talk about talking. Because Jesus says we've got to be very careful how we talk. I was reading a story last week about a little girl who went into a valley. Now, do you know what a valley is? There's quite often a river running through a valley, and there are hills on either side. And sometimes when you speak in a valley, or sometimes in a great big church, you hear an echo, which is your voice coming back. And this wee girl was walking through this valley, and she looked up at the hills, and she said, You are beautiful. And the voice came back, You are beautiful. That was the echo of her voice. And then she said, I think you are very beautiful green and the voice came back I think you are very green 
She thought, I'm not green. The voice came back to her. Then she thought, I'll try something else. I think you are cheeky. And the voice came back, I think you are cheeky. And then she said, I don't like you now. And the voice came back, I don't like you now. You see, when we say something nasty to someone, they're often tempted to say something nasty back. So if you say to somebody, I think you're horrible, they're liable to say, I think you're horrible. And that can lead to a fight. So we have to be careful what we say. If someone says, I think you're horrible, you say, I think you're quite nice. And that just disarms them. They can't say anything more. And they're much like, more likely to be friends with you in the future. So don't say nasty things to people. In the, in, at school, don't say nasty things. Or at nursery, don't say nasty things. Try not to say nasty things at home. Now, I know that's very, very difficult. And sometimes we're tempted to say nasty things because we're human beings. So when you say your prayers at night, you ask Jesus to help you the next day not to say nasty things. And I've tried that, and I can assure you that works. And the only way you can find out if it will work is to try it. So when you pray, always ask God to help you to be a better person. And he will, I'm sure. Thank you for listening today. Now we're going to sing this lovely children's hymn, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know.
Let us now listen for the word of God. Our first reading this morning is taken from Psalm 62, starting at verse 5. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I shall not be shaken. My salvation and my honour depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Low-born men are but a breath, the high-born are but a lie. If weighed in a balance, they are nothing. Together, they are only a breath. Do not trust in extortion or take pride in stolen goods. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard, that you, O God, are strong, and that you, O God, O Lord, are loving. Surely you will reward each person according to what he has done. Our second reading is from Mark chapter 1 and beginning at verse 14, the calling of the first disciples. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Thank you, God, for your word to us today. We now sing together our next hymn. Jesus calls us, O oh, the tumult of our life's wild restless sea.
Now we say our prayers for others. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have called us here this morning to worship and to praise you. We pray now that we may bring to you our concerns for your church and for your world. Lord, we pray that the church may be a vibrant sign of your life in every generation and locality, serving, listening, and loving with the human face of ordinary people like us, lit up with the brightness of God. Lord, lead us, and we will follow. Heavenly Father, we pray that the world's attention may be refocused on what is of lasting value, that in humility, all in authority may hear the real needs, honor them, and act on them. Lord, lead us, and we will follow. We pray that all the households and neighborhoods represented here this morning may be alerted to the signs of glory around them in the ordinary daily miracles and come to welcome Jesus as Lord. And we pray for those who are not able to be here this morning, those who are ill, those who are lonely, those who are weary through the years, those who are bereaved, and all who are sad. Hear us in a moment of quietness. We bring those known to us in these circumstances to you. Lead us, O Lord, and we will follow. We pray that all who are searching for God may realize his closeness to them, that wrong lives may be courageously righted, and damaged lives and attitudes mended. Lord, lead us, and we will follow. And we pray, Lord, that the dying may turn to you and be safely led through that last journey to the peace and the joy of eternal life. We pray that we may all one day experience God's heaven. Lord, lead us, and we will follow. We pray that we may become increasingly aware of your amazing love for each one of us until our hearts are overflowing with thankfulness and praise. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we sing, Will you come and follow me if I but call your name?
in the first chapter of Mark's Gospel, which we heard from this morning. In verse 15, we hear, The time has come, Jesus said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. I suppose everyone here this morning has had a time for a fresh start. Every new year we think we're making a fresh start because it's a new year. When a child gets a new jotter in school, they're making a fresh start. And there's usually some excitement about that thought. Perhaps you've moved into a new house or into a new place. And although there may be some fear about that, there is surely still some excitement about a future which you hope is going to be a happy one, which is now starting. Or you may be moving to a new job, a new job which is going to bring fresh challenges. And although you may have some anxiety about that on the first few days in the new job, you soon settle in and you become excited about the future because you're moving to something new. And of course, every day brings to all of us new challenges, new challenges which we have to face. Recently, we heard from the New Testament of how Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. And at that time, it seems he was made very specially aware of this new stage in his life and the new challenges it would bring. He also learned through this experience of his divinity. He was indeed the Son of God. And we heard how John was sent by God to usher in the coming of this person, Jesus. John's baptism seems to have been simply done by asking people to repent, to repent. And that didn't just mean feeling sorry for what they had said or done. It meant deciding to go a new way. And that's why in the Baptist church, many people when they're baptized are, are usually submerged in a pool. And when they go down into the water, right under the water, while they're there, they're turned. Which is a sign that their old life that was going that way is now changing because they've become in Jesus Christ Christian and they have to follow Jesus, which is very often a different way from the way of the world. And John's baptism then was a baptism just of repentance. The section of Mark's gospel that we heard from today tells us that John was arrested and he was imprisoned. So Mark is clearly emphasizing to all his readers in this passage that the messenger, John the Baptist, had done his job. His work was done. His work was completed. He was the forerunner, the one who came before. It's now time for the principal person to begin his work. A new age has now dawned. So where does Jesus start? Well, we can't be absolutely sure because Mark hasn't necessarily put everything, all the acts of Jesus, into a chronological order, which we might expect. But clearly, he is telling us here that to accomplish what he came to accomplish, Jesus still needed people. He needed ordinary people. 
And Mark goes on to tell us about the call Jesus presented to the first four disciples. We're given no biographical details about these first four disciples, except that they were fishermen. We're not told how Jesus decided to select these people or what previous knowledge, if any, he may have had of them. And I believe that from Mark's point of view, the absence of any detail is deliberate because it serves to draw attention to the fact that the call of God in Jesus comes with divine power, which doesn't have to wait for the right circumstances because it can create the response it demands, which is one of unconditional obedience. We are told nothing more than at the call of Jesus to Simon and Andrew, they left their nets and followed him. Simon and Andrew left their nets. Now, not all fishing on the Sea of Galilee, not, it was done from boats. Some fishermen fished from the water's edge. They waded out into the water, perhaps up to their waist, and then they cast their nets and they waited. They left the nets there in the water. Likewise, if the call of Jesus to James and John, receive, it received an immediate response, though they were fishing from a boat. For they left their father Zebedee, we're told, in the boat with the hired people and followed Jesus. In all cases, it was a call to commitment, to total commitment, a call to follow and to make that call the decisive factor in their lives. Total commitment, no excuses, no stopping to wonder if they could do it. Now, there's no reason to doubt that these disciples had probably had some knowledge of Jesus. They lived in a relatively small community. Almost everyone knew what was going on around them. Mark seems to assume that his readers will almost certainly know who Simon and Andrew are. There's also no reason necessarily to believe that James and John left their father Zebedee without making some provision for his welfare. But why did Jesus choose these men? And why did they follow without question? Without some knowledge of one another, their dramatic action would have been inexplicable and irresponsible. And they wouldn't have known anyway what what Jesus meant by saying he would make them fishers of men. From Mark's point of view, I think the absence of any detail only seems to bring out the, more clearly the moral of the story, which is this, that the call, call of God in Jesus comes with a divine power which doesn't need to wait on accidental human circumstances. The call is to follow or to go after Jesus. And we are called to follow Jesus. We are called to go after him in the confidence that he will lead us. Also in the confidence that he won't lead us into a place where he knows fine we won't be able to cope. That's comforting. However, the phrase go after or follow means more than simply following. It suggests that following will have a cost. The call of Jesus demands commitment and a change of life. No longer putting yourself first, but placing God and his ways first. For Simon and Andrew, that meant leaving their livelihood. In the sentence where we hear that, Jesus called them. We're told that they left their nets and they followed him. Mark seems to imply here that Simon and Andrew left their means of earning and support to follow Jesus. 
They put their past way of life behind them and they set out on a new way. No doubt Mark is also referring here to the concept of this new covenant that Jesus was ushering in, the kingdom of God, to give people the opportunity for a new start, for the forgiveness of sins, for the promise of divine companionship through the Holy Spirit and resurrection to a new, a new way of life. From an old way then to a new way. But so much of this is theology, albeit very important theology, but it is still for many dull and boring. So is there any vital message which is relevant for, for us today from this passage? I believe there is. First of all, we are reminded that God's call to us is demanding. There are some branches of Christianity who preach that all you need to do is commit yourself to Jesus. Change and commit yourself to Jesus and everything will be fine. Life will be happy. You'll have no problems. That's not true. We all have problems. The call of God is demanding because it calls us to leave behind many of the ways we'd often want to go and to stop and ask the question, what would Jesus want me to do here? And we've got to do that all the time. Long after we've committed ourselves to Jesus, we still have to ask this question when we're confronted with a situation in which we really don't know what to do. Sit down and ask the question, what would Jesus want me to do here? I know what I feel like doing. I know what I feel like saying. But is that really what Jesus would have me do now? Secondly, when we have asked that question and found our answer, which may be a difficult and a costly one, there comes his assurance. I'm right in front of you. I am right with you. And I will be with you through this. I will give you the wisdom and the courage to do what you have to do here, costly as it may be. This doesn't mean, you see, that following Jesus is easy. It doesn't mean that we can just sit back and hope that the Holy Spirit will do everything for us. No. The lesson we learn from the calling of these four first disciples is that following Jesus can be costly. Indeed, it costs some of them their lives. But following Jesus brings its rewards. Not away in the future in some heavenly place, Following Jesus and doing what he asks us to do brings rewards here and now, in the present, and will do in the future of whatever time we have left here on earth. And in addition to that, we receive the promise of eternal life, a promise which starts now. So I don't wait, have to wait until I get to heaven to receive eternal life, I receive it now through my response to the call of Jesus to me. Follow me. I will lead you. I hope you will find that true in your experience as you commit yourselves to God and to our Lord Jesus Christ in all the days that lie ahead for you in this world and in the next. Thanks be to God for his word to us today, and to his name be glory and praise. Amen. Your offering will now be received.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you this morning for all that you have done for us in Jesus Christ and for all that you have promised to do for us with him. And so we present these offerings upon this table in thankfulness, praying that they may be used for the furtherance of your kingdom, for the preaching of the good news of Jesus Christ through word and example. This is our prayer we offer in Jesus' name as we dedicate this offering. Amen. Our closing hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. May courage, joyfulness, a quiet mind, and all other gifts from a father to his children be yours. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, rest and remain with you, your families, and all those you love, today and always. Amen.